I'd like to welcome all of you to this Google Slides presentation turned into a YouTube video. Uh, what we learned the hard way is that uh, Google Drive is not uh, able to support a viral link, a video that's being clicked on a lot of times, or audio file for that matter. And so what was happening is some of you were trying to access this presentation and the audio was being blocked out because it had already been viewed too many times for that day. So I apologize, we are learning uh, as we go here and so we're going to start putting things into YouTube format. It's going to change up a little bit, the links aren't going to work, The things, some of the things I had built into it are not going to uh, be able to be done in the video. Uh, but we'll do the best we can with it, and as I make subsequent uh, slideshows after this, I will specifically make them uh, without all of those links so that they can be turned into videos. This slideshow is going to be covering animal adaptations. This is the next unit that 3rd, 4th, and 5th grade were scheduled to begin, and so that's where we're going to start. Our learning objective for today is, I can identify types of animal adaptations. So let's start with, what is an animal adaptation? Well, an animal adaptation is a trait or behavior that helps an animal survive. There are so many different traits and behaviors that are specific to different animals that we're not going to be able to cover them all. But basically, if it's something that an animal, about an animal, a body part, or behavior that's helping them survive, we would call that an adaptation. So I've had kids in the past ask, well, can you just give me a list of the adaptations for me to memorize? And it's not actually that easy. You see, there's too many different adaptations. Each animal has adaptations specific to its environment. So all the different environments have different adaptations. And then the animals within that environment also have their own specific adaptations for whatever their role is in that environment or ecosystem. So there are too many to memorize. But what we can do is just give you a general uh, idea of what we're looking for, some common ones, and that's what we're going to be looking at in this PowerPoint. So let's start out by breaking adaptations into the two major types. So the two major types of adaptations are structures, or body parts, and behaviors. The structures really just are the way that an animal is built. Uh, that can include body covering, or beaks, or teeth, or feet, things like that. And behaviors are a way that an animal acts or something that they do. Uh, sometimes the behaviors are things like hibernation, migration, marking their territory. But all of the adaptations are going to fit into one of those two groups. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this page there's a link that will uh, take you to a slide where you can practice differentiating between which ones are structures or parts and which ones are behaviors. But that also comes up at the end of the slideshow if you don't want to jump to it now. So if we look specifically at behavioral adaptations, or the things that an animal does to help it survive, we also have two types of behavioral adaptations. We have inherited behavioral adaptations. These are instincts. These are things that nobody has to teach the animal. The animal doesn't have to learn it. They're just kind of born knowing and understanding what that is. So that would include hibernation, uh, migration, making a nest, making a web, things that the animal is just driven to do. Uh, we also have learned behaviors, and these are things that an animal could be taught, uh, either by people or their parents, or it could be something that they learn by watching other animals. So uh, really good examples of this would be um, finding a feeder, using a feeder out in a forest, or maybe um, a bear that learns to gather food from the trash, things like that, using tools. Um, there's a lot of animals that, that are able to use tools. Otters use shells, monkeys use sticks, and things to get what they want. So those are learned behaviors. But again, if we're talking about a behavioral adaptation, it's, it's something that the animal has to be doing. When we move into structural adaptations, that's when we start to have so many different categories. Um, the ones that I'm going to hit today are on this slide. And each of these are links. So if you don't have time to do this entire slideshow today, which honestly I don't recommend, this is a lesson I would have taught in my classroom over multiple days, you can come back to this slide and it will jump, when you click on the word, it will jump to that section of the slideshow. So again, this slideshow is not meant to be one, uh, one day of lessons. This is actually something that I would take generally an entire week to cover. So the categories that we're going to be hitting are teeth, beaks, feet, body coverings, defenses, and types of camouflage. So in this section, we're going to be talking about different types of adaptations for animals' teeth. And by looking at the type of teeth that an animal has, or what the teeth are adapted for, 
we can tell what types of food the animal would generally be eating. So one type of teeth that we would see would be teeth that would belong to an herbivore or a plant eater. Uh, the teeth of an herbivore are suited to eating plants. So what we're mostly going to find are flat molars. The molars are used to grind up the vegetation, the plants that the animal is eating. You'll see some herbivores also have incisors in the front for cutting off or breaking the grasses or the plants. But for the most part, they're going to have those flat molars in the back, which are used for grinding up the plants that they eat. The next type of teeth adaptation you would see would belong to animals who are carnivores or are meat eaters. Uh, the teeth of a carnivore are basically suited to eating animals. They're going to have very sharp, what we call canine teeth or pointed teeth. These are used for ripping and tearing. And even the molars that they have in the back, because they do have molars in the back of their mouth as well, but those are also going to be sharp and pointed, again, for tearing apart the meat that the animal would be eating. So the last type of teeth adaptation that we'll be talking about in elementary school would be the teeth that belong to an omnivore. An omnivore eats both plants and animals. So they're actually going to have a combination of the teeth that we already talked about. The omnivores are going to have the flat molars for grinding, but they're also going to have the sharp canines for ripping and tearing. And then also in the very front, they'll have incisors for cutting apart. So the omnivores uh, have a mouth that has all of the types of teeth. In this next section, we're going to be looking at beak adaptations. So different types of birds have different beaks, and those beaks would tell us uh, what types of food the bird would normally be eating. So the first type of beak that we're going to look at is a hooked beak. Hooked beaks are useful for ripping and tearing flesh. So these birds are carnivores, and they're going to be eating small animals, small mammals, things like that. So next up we have a scoop beak. Uh, scoop beaks are useful for straining small plants, seeds, and tiny organisms from muddy water. And so these are going to be water birds and what they would do is get a big scoop of the water up and then they are able to filter that water and get out the plants or the seeds or maybe small fish, whatever it is that they were hunting for in that water. Next up we have short rounded beaks. Uh, short rounded beaks are used for cracking seeds and eating small insects. These are the type of beak that we're going to see on most of the birds that are common in our yards. Then we have spear shaped beaks and they do exactly what they sound like. Uh, spear shaped beaks are useful for spearing fish, uh, basically stabbing down into the water and they're able to pull the fish up by poking the beak through it. Uh, next up we have chisel shaped beaks. Chisel-shaped beaks are useful for drilling into trees. Uh, the birds that are doing this would generally be trying to get into the tree to find some type of an insect. And lastly, we have long tube beaks. And long tube beaks are useful for drinking nectar from long slender flowers. So on this slide, I have examples of different types of birds, and then underneath them, I have all of the beaks that we just talked about. So we talked about hooked beaks, which are for meat eaters, and we talked about scooped beaks, which are for the filter feeders, short rounded beaks, which are birds that eat seeds and insects, spear shaped beaks for spearing fish, chisel shaped beaks for drilling into trees, and long two beaks to get nectar out of flowers. And then up above that, I have various different birds. And so we're going to see if we can match the bird that we're looking at to the type of beak that that bird actually has. So the first picture that you can see there is a chicken. And the chicken should belong with the short rounded beak. The second picture that you see there, those are pelicans. And pelicans have scooped beaks for scooping up water um, and filtering out what they want, the fish. The next bird that you see there is a yellow-bellied sapsucker, and a yellow-bellied sapsucker is a lot like a woodpecker. Instead of going into the tree for um, the insects, they're actually drilling into trees to try to get the sap or to try to get the, the uh, nectar out of the tree. Uh, the next thing that you see there is a hawk. That hawk is a meat eater, so it has a hooked beak. Then we have a hummingbird. The hummingbird has a long tube beak. And lastly, we have a crane, and the crane has a spear-shaped beak for spearing fish. 
So in this next section, we are going to be looking at adaptations of the feet. And again, there are many different types of adaptations for feet. I'm only going to hit the ones that are most commonly tested or that we see the most often. So the first type of feet that we're going to look at are padded feet. Um, padded feet allow the animals to move quietly and spread their weight out evenly. So a lot of our larger mammals actually have these um, padded feet. And oftentimes in combination with the padded feet, you'll find sharp claws. The claws allow the animals to rip or hold down their prey. So you can see on the bear and the lion, they actually have both the claws and the padded feet on the slide. Next up for feet, we have webbed feet. The webbed feet are going to allow animals to push through the water to swim better. So anytime we see webbed feet, then we have to understand that we're gonna be looking at some kind of a water animal. Uh, very common with ducks and turtles. You can see there the otter has a slight webbing between uh, the, the toes on his feet as well. Most water animals that are going to be swimming a lot either have fins or they're going to have webbed feet that would allow them to, to swim better. This is also one of the um, types of feet that is very, very commonly tested. So talons are a type of feet that we generally see on predatory birds. These uh, talons would allow the birds to grasp onto branches as well as hold down or tear and eat their prey. It's almost like a hand that can grab onto things and they have very long claws generally on the ends of the toes of their talons. Some animals have what we call grasping feet. Uh, these type of feet allow the animal to hold onto branches and food. Uh, very common in primates. Uh, you can also see in the slide there, there's a chameleon who's able to grab on uh, to the branch. So koalas, these are uh, grasping feet. They allow them to grasp or hold on to things. On this next side, we see hooves. And hooves themselves are not actually feet. Um, they're more like a toenail that protects the feet. But um, hooves would allow an animal to walk or stand on hard surfaces for long periods of time. And we're going to see hooves um, in, our, in our herbivores. So I really like the diagram that they have there that shows that the toe is actually up in the hoof. Um, and then you can see the hoof around the toe that is protecting it. But it is a, a type of feet or it's a type of... Um, toenail that grows around that specific type of feet and it's to enable the animal to walk or stand on hard surfaces uh, for a long time. So in this section we are going to be looking at different types of body covering adaptations. So what's on the outside of the animal. So fur is one of the common types of a body covering that an animal can have. Depending on the type of fur the animal has, the function or the purpose of that fur could be for different reasons. So they could use it for protection. And you can see there the red panda, the bottom of their feet are actually covered in fur. And that's because the red pandas live in a snowy region and they need that fur on the bottom of their foot to help protect it from the cold snow. Um, underneath that, a type of, of hair or fur would be whiskers, and so those are used for sensory purposes, for feeling around, um, realizing what's around them. Um, back at the top, we can see the otters that have waterproofing fur, so this allows them to swim and their actual skin itself is not wet and waterlogged all of the time. Um, underneath the otter, we can see the arctic fox, and their fur is serving as a camouflage uh, for them to blend into the snow. And then lastly, we have other types of fur which can be used for temperature control. Uh, the polar bear, um, interestingly, has actually hollow fur, um, and that allows the air to be trapped inside, and air is an insulator, and so that allows the polar bear to be kept warmer. They can also have different thicknesses of fur or different layers of fur in order to keep their uh, temperature under control, especially if they live in a colder environment. Scales are another type of body covering that we often see, and the, pretty much the primary purpose of an animal to have scales would be for protection. Um, scales are not only on reptiles, we also find scales on fish, and on uh, mammals, you can see there is a, a pangolin uh, in the very first picture, and that is actually a mammal that's covered in scales. And the last type of body covering that we're going to discuss are feathers. And just like the fur, the feathers can have uh, different purposes. So one of the purpose of feathers is to enable the birds to fly. Um, birds are, are the only ones that have the feather covering. And so flight would be one purpose or function of the feathers. Another uh, function of the feathers would, would be to attract females. Um, in the bird world, the male birds are often the ones that are most colorful and they use those colors to attract the females to them. 
Uh, some birds have waterproof uh, feathers, and so like the penguin there in that picture. Uh, the picture under the penguin, there is actually an owl um, against that tree, and so the feathers can help the bird to camouflage. And lastly, again, just like fur, the feathers can serve as a temperature control for the bird. Oftentimes they'll have different layers of feathers, um, very small ones that are closer to their skin, and then the larger ones for flight that are over it, especially if they're a colder weather bird. So feathers are a body covering for birds that, again, can have very, um, very wide range of purposes. Our next section is special defenses. And this starts to get really specific into different animals because they're not all of the animals are going to have all of these specific defenses. So our first defense is quite common and that would be uh, an animal that has horns. You can see from the photographs that the horns are even on birds, there are fish that have horns, there are mammals, there are reptiles. So this is a common uh, defense uh, adaptation that a lot of animals have and they can use those horns uh, when trying to defend themselves. For the next defensive adaptations, uh, some animals have a defense of emitting a very foul smell. And so these organisms, all of these organisms that are on this page, they all smell really bad, either all of the time, or they could emit that uh, whenever they're scared or whenever they're trying to get something to leave it alone. So we have a stink bug, we have a stink bird, uh, we have a musk ox, a badger, millipedes, and of course, skunks. There are quite a few animals that have a defense adaptation of having a really uh, bad taste or bitter taste. Um, and a lot of times that bad taste adaptation comes with warning coloration. So animals that are very brightly colored, uh, that will oftentimes serve as a warning to other animals that they're gonna taste bad or that they're poisonous. Um, and so all of the animals that you can see here in this uh, slide, they are all either taste very bad or if an animal were to bite them, they would emit some kind of a, a poison through their skin. And you can see all of them have very, very bright colors to try to warn away the predators as well. The next defensive adaptation that I'm going to talk about is that of spines, and sometimes they're also called quills. So on this slide, you see um, a diff bunch of different organisms that all have some kind of a spine or a quill uh, that they can use as a defense. Oftentimes their spines are relaxed and not causing an issue if someone were to try to pet them. I've actually owned a hedgehog myself um, and you could hold her and she was perfectly fine until she got irritated. And then she kind of uh, puffed out her spikes and then it became difficult to hold her because she was very prickly. Same thing with a puffer fish. They swim around a lot of the time and their spines are there, but it's not until they get upset or scared and they puff out that their spines actually become extremely sharp. Um, so there's lots of different examples here of different organisms that all have spines or quills. Sometimes animals will emit a sound and that adaptation uh, might be to scare away a predator. Uh, there are also other sounds that sometimes the animals will emit whenever they're trying to attract a mate. Um, but for this case, we're talking about defensive adaptation. So we have a rattlesnake here, and the other snake that's on this page is actually a bull snake. And the bull snake can hiss and shake its tail to where other animals will think it's a rattlesnake, but it does make that hissing sound. Uh, if you've ever owned a cat, cats will hiss at you as a warning. Uh, we have ravens and hissing cockroaches, um, and then there's also uh, different types of birds that will also make uh, sounds that are just basically to warn off the predators. Um, and hopefully that will prevent them from being attacked. Another defensive adaptation that animals might have would be some type of body armor. Um, of course, we can all think of like turtles and tortoises, sea turtles that would have it, um, but there are other animals that have body armor as well. So we have an armadillo there with that uh, shell. Uh, again, we have the pangolin, and at the top uh, you can see a rhinoceros. They have very thick, tough skin. Um, and depending on what type of rhinoceros, it can look like the ones in these pictures where their skin is sort of plated together. So body size is a really interesting defensive uh, adaptation because it's not one that we generally would think of unless we're looking at specific examples and I'm pointing it out. Um, a lot of you have seen house cats or you've seen videos of cats and the cat will turn its body sideways and puff up its fur. And the cat in that case is actually trying to look as large as possible, trying to scare off whatever is frightening it or whatever it thinks is an issue. Um, the same thing there uh, with the king cobra snake. They don't always have the hood extended or up. The hood can be relaxed. And when they feel threatened, they'll extend that hood to try to again appear as if they're a larger snake. 
Um, we can see the puffer fish there. Um, I tried to find a picture where he was deflated and then the same type of fish was inflated. And the same thing with the frilled lizard. The whole point of that frill around his head is to make him look larger, a little more scary perhaps. And so he uses that as a defense to try to get the predator to leave him alone. And that will bring us to our last category of structural adaptations. Uh, these are uh, camouflage adaptations, and a lot of times when we think of camouflage, we only think of blending in, um, but I'm going to show you different types of camouflage here and how camouflage can be used uh, to help an animal survive. So some animals have camouflage coloring that changes by season. Uh, this is a good example here, and it's often used um, in practice work, is the snowshoe hare or the arctic hare. So in the summertime, uh, whenever the snow has mostly melted in their habitat, they're going to be a brownish color, like you can see in the picture that's to the right. And then in the winter time, their fur changes color, they grow in a new coat, and they have the white color fur to help them to blend in with the snow. So their color changes by season so that they can blend in as a camouflage. Some animals have special colors or patterns on them in order to help them blend in as their type of camouflage. So in the very first picture, there is actually a tiger they're going through all of those grasses. And the second picture is a picture of a herd of zebra. And I know people would think, well, how in the world are stripes going to blend in with anything? But you can see that with the example of the tiger, the stripes do kind of uh, blend in with the shadows and the grasses. So a lone zebra, that might work for them. But another thing that zebras do is they, um, because all of them are striped and they travel in herds, it's often confusing to predators to figure out where one zebra starts and one zebra stops, especially if they're running. So it makes it harder for the predator to actually attack a specific zebra and unless one happens to like lag behind. But it's also confusing coloration, all of those stripes moving around together. Um, there is a giraffe in the third picture there. The fourth picture has a frog and then we have an owl and then we have a snake at the bottom. So you can see that sometimes the camouflage would be a specific color pattern in order to help the animal to blend in uh, to its surroundings. Another very interesting type of camouflage would be the false eyes. Um, this is interesting because the patterning on the animal uh, confuses other animals because it looks like they have eyes in different places. Um, and this is true for you have mammals there, you have insects there, you have amphibians, you have fish, uh, you have birds. So this is true on all of the types of animals that they could have this type of false eyes, which again is it's confusing and it helps them to, I guess it doesn't really help them to blend in but it does help confuse the other animals um, and make them think that they're, the animal, the prey, is looking at the predator when in fact in most of these examples the animal is actually looking in a completely different direction from the eye that we're seeing. So mimicry is the last type of camouflage adaptation that I want to cover. And so mimicry is when an animal acts like or is patterned to look like a different animal in order to avoid being attacked. Um, and so there's lots of different ways that that could work. Uh, one way, if you look at the two butterflies that are here, or the two snakes, or even the two wasps, they, um, or the, I'm sorry, the wasp and the moth, the two butterflies look almost identical, and if it were just fluttering around out in nature, you probably wouldn't be able to tell very quickly which of the two that it was. Um, but one of them is poisonous, and one of them is actually completely harmless if another animal were to eat it. Um, and typically, the animals just, just leave both of them alone because they're both poisonous. Same thing with the snake. Um, the coloration on the snake is very, very similar. So the red, black, and yellow people and other animals will just leave that alone because one of them is poisonous and one of them is harmless. Um, there's other examples where the organism actually looks like something else or behaves like something else. Um, and so the, like the gecko that's in the first picture there, he looks completely like a leaf. He's not a leaf, um, it, it actually is a lizard, a gecko. Um, there's a frog in that second picture. The third picture are a fish. And then the last uh, picture there is another insect. So they don't look like what they are. They look like their surroundings. And that helps them avoid um, being captured by predators. So as I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, there are so many different adaptations. We can't possibly cover them all. Um, but a lot of them depend on the environment or the ecosystem that the animal lives in. So if an animal lived in a particularly hot ecosystem, they would have adaptations to help them live there, such as having large ears or, or burrowing underground to escape the heat. Uh, if they live somewhere cold, 
then they would have adaptations that would be suited to them living cold. They might have a layer of blubber. Or they might have very small ears. Um, adaptations to get food. Uh, adaptations to survive with very little water. Adaptations for being nocturnal. So the biggest thing is um, you have to think about the body part or the structure and how it helps the animal survive where they live. Uh, in order to figure out about the adaptation. Again, it could be a behavior, but most of the adaptations that we're talking about are going to be structures, body parts of the animal. I hope this presentation has been helpful in teaching you about animal adaptations. After this slide, there are some additional activities that you can do or some videos, the links to videos on YouTube that you can watch about animal adaptations if you happen to have the time. I do miss being at school, I miss teaching science, and I hope to see you all real soon. Thanks for watching. On this slide, I had several links that were to different animal adaptation videos that were on YouTube. I can't link it through this uh, video, but what you can do is you can actually type in some of these titles into the YouTube search bar and find these videos about animal adaptations. The other thing that I can do is I can create a playlist of these videos and uh, put it on my YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to that channel, then you would be able to access the playlist for animal adaptations. Sorry, they were put in as links whenever it was a Google Slides. And since we've had to change platforms uh, due to bandwidth, we're going to go ahead and have to do it this way. So this page is a short version of trying to decide which uh, Things that are listed here happen to be structural adaptations or behavioral adaptations. And so what it's asking you to do is just choose the numbers that you think are structural uh, adaptations of an animal. So number one says ducks have webbed feet to swim. Number two, possums play dead to confuse their predators. Three, geese migrate in the winter to get food all year. Four, frogs have strong legs to hop far. Five, polar bears dig dens to stay warm in the cold. Six, zebras have stripes to help camouflage. Seven, koalas define their territory by scratching trees. Eight, giraffes have an extra large heart to pump blood to their long neck. Nine, spiders spin webs to catch their prey. Ten, bald eagles have a long wide bell to help them fly. 11, a polar bear has thick rough pads on their feet to better walk on ice. And 12, woodchucks hibernate through the winter. So if you want to write down the numbers that you think are actually showing structural adaptations of an animal, and then you click the mouse, uh, uh, a box will pop up that has the numbers of the correct answers to the question. The rest of the slides in this presentation are actually task cards that I would have normally used in my classroom. I would have cut them up and I would have had the students uh, as a group discuss the adaptation that was described on the card and decide if it was a behavioral adaptation or something the organism is doing or a structural adaptation, uh, something that's a part, a physical part of the organism. Uh, we don't have that capability uh, through YouTube and I can't even put the answers on each slide and have them pop up after a few seconds because of turning this into a video. So the workaround that I have come up with is if you want to get a sheet of paper and pause the video number 1 to 48 and then just put an S or a B by each number card as it's read aloud of what you think it is. And the very last slide I'll go ahead and add in a slide that uh, gives the numbers that are structural cards and the ones that are behavioral cards so that you could check your work. Uh, sorry, once we had to change to a YouTube, this kind of changed uh, some of the things I had in this PowerPoint. Card one, Canadian geese migrate in winter to get food all year. Card two, the Arctic fox has thick fur to keep it warm. Card three, Chipmunks collect and store food so they can find it in winter. Card four, ducks have webbed feet to help swim. Card five, possums play dead to confuse predators. Card seven, hawks have sharp claws to catch and kill their prey. Card six, woodchucks hibernate through a long winter. Card eight, rabbits have large ears so they can hear and avoid danger. 
card nine. Now this is not actually an animal. This is a plant adaptation, which we will get to in another PowerPoint, uh, but the card was included in this set. A rose bush has thorns to discourage animals from eating them. Card 10. Leaf insects are shaped like a leaf, so predators think they are real leaves. Card 12. Leaf insects sway as they walk so that they look like leaves blowing in the wind. Card 13. Frogs have long, strong legs to hop quickly and far. Card 11. A beaver's front teeth grow continuously to be able to chew wood. Card 14. Beavers claim their territory by building piles of mud and marking it with a scent. Card 15. A moose has long legs to walk through deep snow, over bushes and logs, and wade through marshes. Card 16. Male moose, called bulls, roar loudly to attract mates. Card 17. A polar bear has very small ears to keep it from losing heat. Card 18. A polar bear has thick rough pads on their feet to better walk on ice. Card 19. Armadillos can roll up into a ball to protect their undersides. Card 21. An oak tree drops its leaves in the winter to avoid snow damage. Card 20. A penguin is white on the front and black on its back to camouflage in the water. Card 22. Penguins make nests side by side and huddle to keep the chicks warm. Card 24. A sea turtle has four limbs that can be rotated so that they swim and move on land to lay eggs. Card 23. Sea turtles return to the same beaches to lay their eggs every year. So this entire slide is actually dealing with plant adaptations, but again, if you think about it, it could be structural or it could be behavioral. If it's a part of the plant, then it would be structural, and if it's something that the plant is doing, then it would be behavioral. Card 25. A birch tree has wide, large leaves on high up branches to catch sunlight for photosynthesis. Card 26. The leaves of a pitcher plant form pitchers, water holding jugs, to drown and digest insects for nutrients. Card 27. The arctic willow has shallow roots because the ground is permanently frozen under a shallow layer of thawed soil. Card 28. The mesquite tree has long root systems to draw water from deep underground. Card 29. A bald eagle will often get their meals by stealing the kills of other animals. Card 32. Bald eagles have long, wide tail to help soar high in the sky. Card 31. The pelican first uses its elastic pouch to catch fish, then they drain out the water and swallow the fish. Card 30. Pelicans help each other by swimming together and beating their wings on the surface to move the fish into shallow water. Now I will say that on this slide, uh, card 31, I had to go back and forth trying to decide if they were talking about the structure or the actual action of doing this. And I believe that they meant the structure that the pelican actually has, that scoop beak, that allows them to um, complete the task that's on the card. So the function of that beak is to filter and drain out the water to give them the, the fish that they can swallow. So I believe they were talking about the structure of the beak, but that's one that I could have argued in either direction. Card 33. A puffer fish has an elastic stomach to take in huge amounts of water so that they become a large ball several times their normal size. Card 34. Puffer fish swim slow and clumsy, which makes it easy to be attacked by a predator. Card 37. Sharks do not have any bones in their body. They have a skeleton of cartilage. Card 35. 
the great white shark attacks and surprises their prey, seals and sea lions, from below. Card 36. A green basilisk lizard has long toes on their rear feet with fringe-like scales that allow them to walk on water. Card 38. Green basilisk lizards are very territorial and spend most of the time in trees near the water to protect their space. Card 39. The stripes on a king snake look like those on a poisonous coral snake. Card 42. Spiders spin sticky webs to trap insects to eat. Card 40. When threatened, a skunk will raise its tail and spray a toxin at the predator. Card 41. Bumblebees have a long tongue to get nectar from flowers. Card 43. Camels store fat, not water, in their hump that can be used for energy later. Card 44. Giraffes have an extra large heart to pump blood up to their long necks to the brain. So card 43 is another one that I could probably argue both ways. Car camels storing fat, not water, in their hump. The actual hump itself would be the structural adaptation. Um, and then the process of storing the fat could be argued as a behavior. Um, I believe in this instance the um, makers of this deck of cards uh, was trying to get the children to understand that the hump was a structural adaptation, but the wording on that is a little confusing. So I could have argued that one either way as well. Card 45. Cheetah will stalk their prey before pouncing on them to get as close as possible. Card 46. Female birds of paradise will watch the males dance to decide who to mate with. Card 47. Male peacocks have beautiful feathers to attract a mate with. Card 48. Polar bear dig dens to stay warm in the cold. 